right, let's not waste any time getting in today on this, the greatest Tuesday you've had all week. Welcome to the True Wealth Radio Show. Dave Littlejohn in studio today with me. Matt Dixon. Matt. Yes. We say this every time. Have we got a show for you? This one will be fun, though, I think. This one's funny. Actually, mm -hmm. it's fun and funny, and I uh, actually like the idea of it. Um, you know, when I was thinking about radio show prep today, I had some ideas in mind. And I read through some of the thoughts that I had, and I'm like, gosh, you know, it sounds like something we've done before. How about something new, something fresh? Something, yeah, fresh. And the funny thing is, none of it's new, but it's a new take. It's fresh. <laughs> it's fresh. <laughs> yeah, we'll go with fresh. We'll go with fresh. I had, uh, I spent like a whole bunch of time just, uh, I've been on the road for like six hours in the la out of the last 24, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of podcast time. And uh, those of you that know me, I listen to podcasts at like a little past 2x speeds, like 2.3, 2.4. So it's like listening to chipmunks. But you get stuff faster that way. And uh, that, anyway. that doesn't wear you out. Like you're on a road trip. Instead of just listening to some music and relaxing, you're like, Two times the speed. Give me the pod. Like just cramming your brain full of information. Uh, nope. Keeps me going. I like it. Wow. <laughs> Most people would be like at the end of the car drive, you know, just hopping out of the vehicle. My mind is fried. You know, the gears have been cranking too fast. I do have to switch topics so that I don't get fried. What so. do you switch between? Uh, I was so I'm reading one. I forget the author, but I'm listening. Right. So I was listening to a book called uh, The Forty Six Immutable Laws of Power. So that's an interesting one. Um, it could be used for nefarious purposes. I don't do you, advise that. How many books do you get through in a year? Uh, I don't know. Is it a lot? Is it more than five? Yes. More than ten? Yes. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, I go through books. I didn't realize you were such a, a big re like book person. So books, and then I do a lot of podcasting, or I do a lot of topical do searching. Do you ever like read the book, or is it all audiobooks? I do a lot of, so I'm a fairly auditory learner, uh, but I do a lot of audio. I definitely read books too. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. It's a different kind of engagement. Um, my issue is like when I read, I tend to read kind of slower than I want to because I tend to say the words See, in my head. I'm the opposite. I hate audiobooks. Can't stand them. But I'm curious, have they like started to use AI to do the audiobooks, or are they still paying people to like sit there and read them and record it? Mostly, it's people who have actually read them. Yeah. They have actual okay. narrators, and so and the narrator does make a difference. If there's, I'm just know, waiting for like others. the well, series. It's already exists. Like, yeah, okay. You know, there's AI does. readers yeah. out there. I mean, they they've been for a long time. Some better than others, but it's sort of robotic readers. <laughs> uh, the cadence can be a little awkward at times. We're like, that wasn't really what it's supposed to sound like. Yeah. But yeah. but not on. I've not had like books that I've purchased huh. and had them narrated in a poor way. Yeah. So or, well, I should say I've had poor narrators, but I haven't had them like a computer narration that I paid for. Got gotcha. that I can tell anyway. Usually it says oh, I'm read by so and so. Hmm. So yeah. Anyway, I, I do. I like digesting information. I get into like I go down rabbit holes for topics to do deep like. It's probably fairly deep research for some or others. They're like well, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and it can be goofy stuff. Like I've learned a lot about ultralight backpacking gear because at one point that became a thing for me because mm -hmm. I like to backpack, but I have sleep apnea, so I have to carry a CPAP with me. And so that's like just dead weight right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. So then you get really clever about how to reduce weight in all kinds of other ways to just make it more tolerable. So Instead of packing your food, you catch your food. All sorts of little... No, we don't do that. <laughs> Usually we pack the food. <laughs> Matt's a better hunter. I'm more of a gatherer, I guess. Yikes. Uh, <laughs> could probably, there'd be some fishing opportunities. There you go. That, by the way, if you really want to know the way to Matt's heart, fishing. it's fishing, not fish, just so you know. Yeah, yeah I don't Matt, eat Matt doesn't eat the fish. Just you know, I do them. like tuna, though. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. new? Oh, yeah, I love tuna. It's like the fresh stuff okay. off the dock. Tuna burgers, cut it up into little tiny cubes, smash it together, so good. Okay. Well, there that, you go. That's the one fish I'll eat. All well, the other you know, ones, yeah. I, I usually have them as tuna melts, but you know, tuna burger, however yeah. you want to call it, I'm yeah. good. I'm good yeah. with that. So look, let's talk about, so Matt, you, yeah. we're not really talking about my um, weird uh, habits of podcasts <laughs> and uh, reading at 2x plus speeds. It's, um, 
Yeah, yeah so. the show's more about like, what are some of those bizarre spending habits that people have or just bizarre ways that people handle money? And then maybe kind of some of those misconceptions around how money works or just, you know. Yeah, here's another thing I would like to phrase this as. It comes out of behavioral finance. Okay. Like, unbeknownst to Matt, but he did this, right? Um, behavioral finance is a study of how people make financial decisions. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that is really fascinating is the concept that we will make normal decisions that are wrong. Okay, so it's normal to do it, but it's the it, but the information leads you to the wrong, yeah, uh, could, the wrong cons the, the wrong outcome if you are or the wrong decision. But it's still typical, right? So yep. like normal meaning it's common, it's typical, but it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'll I'll give an example out of the gate. It's not on your list, right? But sure. as an example, if you go to a casino, and you play a round of blackjack and immediately win, and let's mm -hmm. say you you know you bet twenty bucks and now you got forty bucks, and so what people will say is, oh, is it going back to that theory of like, this is the house's money? Yes, like, it it's is. Not it's mine. like, oh, it's not mine. I can bet this one now because if I lose it, it's just the house's money. Yeah. You know, that's a totally normal way to think. It's totally wrong. That is your money now, and mm -hmm. it's a whole new set of odds, and you're setting down, and that hand is independent of the other hands, and the odds are recalculated and recalibrated at that point. Mm -hmm. But people don't do that in their minds. Right. They say, whatever rationalization they can conjure to say, well, I came here to do this, and I'm doing it, mm -hmm. right? It's a, I had an entertainment budget, and I'm gonna stay here for this amount of time until, until it's, all I, gone. Until it's yeah. gone, yeah. right? And by the way, casinos count on this, right? They count on gambler behavior, which is that most people will continue to double down until they're gone, right? right? And so, as the expression goes, casinos aren't built by winners. I had some self-control. I was at a casino two weeks ago. And I made enough money to leave with like, I don't know, 20 bucks and p the pay for my like $45 steak dinner. So I made like 65 bucks and I'm like, you know what? I'm good with that, I'm walking away. I've had enough luck, I'm gonna lose this at some point. So I walked away with my $20 and a steak in my belly. As and he says it. this, and then goes and bets on the Padres or something. Yeah, no, so. seriously. <laughs> All right, but this is not the show about gambling. That's an illustration though about how that's a normal thing to do, but it's wrong to think it's the house's money. Mm -hmm. It's yours, right? right? And so, but but we all do that. That's normal. So I think there's there's a number of things that we can talk about here. What are some of the things? Like, like I'm not trying to hijack. Matt did a lot of good show prep here. I'm trying to like, how do I hand the reins back over to you? Be like, Matt, what do we need to talk about? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I can give you some examples of some things that I think people do as an you know that might walk and talk like a good idea, but maybe it's not, right? I'm listening. Uh, one of the things I've seen is people will come in and say, hey, you know, I've got multiple investment accounts, and I'm, you know, really reducing my risk by having all these different accounts. And then you start looking at the accounts, and you're like, did you realize almost all of your holdings are exactly the same? So it's really not that different as if you just had one account invested in the exact same thing. Well, <laughs> or here's the same thing. I see people that will have one account, but they'll buy several things that are statistically the same thing. Right? right. They'll buy five different mutual funds that are 85% common holdings. Right. And go, oh, and so there's a bunch of overlap in here, so you're mm -hmm. really not any more diversified. You just bought multiple ticker symbols that own the same stuff inside of them. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that, that one's always funny to me. That that is funny to me. It's that that misconception of diversification. You know, a lot of people don't get what diversification is really about. Yeah. Right. I mean, diversification requires what it really is is a quest for multiple investments with low cross correlation. Right. Like okay? your house is probably not super highly correlated to the. S&P 500. Right, and correlation is how closely linked is something. So if one investment goes right. up, does the yeah. other one go up at the if, same time for the same reason? Right. If so, they're highly correlated. So you're not getting a lot of benefit to diversification. I always say like Home Depot and Lowe's are really similar stores. And so they, they move in lockstep with each other a lot. They're not the same store, so mm -hmm. there are subtle differences, but they have a lot of the same influencing factors. Right. So you're not getting a tremendous amount of diversification benefit by owning those two stores. There's some, 
right? But you're not yeah. getting nearly the benefit of if you invested in, say, and I'm not, this isn't a recommendation, right? But it, like Home Depot and Microsoft, mm -hmm. right? They're really different companies. They have some things that are overlapping, but there's much lower correlation between Microsoft and Home Depot than between Home Depot and Lowe's. Mm -hmm. Okay, so good example. What else you got? Um, one of them, this is where we might kind of stray from Dave Ramsey's approach, but it's that all debt is bad, right? And some people live and die by that. It's like, I can't have any debt. It's, it's, it's the worst yeah. thing ever. And it's like, and I talked to someone recently, they had a 0% loan on like a heating and cooling system or something. Mm -hmm. And it was financed for like four years. And they were freaking out about it. And I'm like, it's a 0%. <laughs> like, it's not costing you anything to borrow that money. Why is that such a bad deal? Like, you can use low interest debt to your benefit and it's not always bad, it's... Yeah, we could have kind of a behavioral conversation around that, but here's my, my key takeaway. Dave Ramsey's not wrong in that. He has this expression where he says, look, if you play with snakes long enough, you're gonna get bit. So, mm -hmm. And I go, well, that's true, but it, it's also sort of kind of built on a improper conflation that, uh, that, that all like, like debt is, is immediately a snake, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if you have clumsy behavior, or you dance with too much debt, yeah, I mean, if well, if bad, yeah, that is within the bad behavior concept, right? Mm -hmm. If you have too much debt, or if you don't pay something off, then you, yeah, you pay interest. It dings you for it, right? If you mm -hmm. can't stay organized, I think the larger problem is that the Dave Ramsey crowd, he starts oftentimes with people that they've already blown it, right? I've, right. I've, I've racked up all this credit card debt, it was a terrible idea, now what? And you're having to retrain from away from terrible decisions. And it's kind of like, you can't say to a recovering alcoholic, it's okay, just drink in moderation. Yeah. Right, it's like, no, it's all or nothing, mm -hmm. right? Like that's it, you, you, there's no middle ground to this. And that's sort of the way debt gets treated in that scenario with the Dave Ramsey crowd. It's like, if you cannot be trusted with debt, then don't have debt. Right. Right, I mean, I can say this with lots of stuff, by the way, not just debt, my favorite example is firearms, right? If you cannot be trusted with a firearm, you're dangerous, none, you get none. Right. Okay, but, we have a right for a reason, right? I'm actually a big Second Amendment guy, and so I'm like, look, if you can be trusted with them, that's totally fine. It's that know thyself thing, right? Yeah. Like if you know that you're bad with money, don't load up on debt. <laughs> yeah, I was right, but if you know you're bad with money, just don't have any money. No, that's not <laughs> what we're saying. No, get better at it, develop right. skills, okay? Yeah. So, okay. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's true. Like the, this idea of painting all debt as instantaneously evil, um, and yet, you know, saying, oh, but you can have a mortgage on your house. Mm -hmm. Why is that different? Well, it's asset backed. Right. Right. That's the primary thing is loans that are backed by assets versus loans that are unsecured. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they are not all created equal. In your HVAC example, it, it, that's kind of a weird one because it, it's 0%, but it, it is not, it is consumer backed, right? They, they're not going to take back your HVAC if you don't pay in the traditional sense. Maybe they could try to, but like it'd be kind of weird, right? Yeah. They may put a lien on other property, something like that. So in that case, I always suggest have the money to pay it off. You just don't need to. Yeah. The other one that I think um, is a good one is for the people that just like to hoard money, like the keep it under your mattress type of people. Mm. That's another one where I'm like, pause on this for a sec. Pause yeah. on this idea because I think this is worth unpacking. Like, why is money in the mattress kind of an issue? But I'm looking at the time. We're running a little long. Are we? Okay. Yeah. Let's so let's do break. this. We'll grab a break. We're going to come back, and Matt is going to talk about mattresses. Yes. And money too. All Firm, right. soft, and everything in between. <laughs> yeah. Where could we go wrong with this one? <laughs> we'll find out. Stick around. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. You got True Wealth on News Radio 939 FM and 1240 KQEN. All right, gang, welcome back to the True Wealth Radio Show. I'm your host, Dave Littlejohn. Your studio today is Matt Dixon. And you can catch up by grabbing the podcast. David, little... you've been listening to too much stuff on two times the speed, and now you're like, I'm going to try talking that fast so we can cram more information. Ah, into we got to get show. it all in there. Let's go, man. Besides, oh. people can listen faster. You can hear faster than you can speak. So you got to get it out there because their mind's going to wander if we don't and crank. And if you want to hear David in two times the speed, you can catch our podcast tomorrow. <laughs> right. Go to littlejohnfs.com, look under the Educate tab. Matt, yep. talk to me about mattresses. Well, per. 
you know, on my end, I really like a memory foam mattress. Some people hey, like talk hybrid. to me about money in the mattress. Oh, money in the mattress. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, some people really actually, you know, still do that method where it's like I'm just going to stockpile my cash. I'm going to hide it from people. Step. I'm going to yeah. I mean, it could literally it be cash can. in a safe. Yeah. It could be. You know, cookie jar, no, sock drawer, whatever. I do, I'm going to say this, asterisk, I do like having a certain amount of cash always on hand. And the reason for that is, if I see something that's a crazy good deal and it's like, I need four grand, I want to be able to just grab that money and go buy it without having to worry about, is my bank open? It's funny, you know, we have different thought processes around this. I keep cash around because I might need to pay a babysitter. Yeah, <laughs> you're like, I'm not using that money to buy another boat. I'm just paying like, the babysitter. I'm not getting another boat, right? I'm going to have friends with boats. <laughs> well, you know, I also look at it like, what if there's a gun that someone's selling and it's a Sunday evening? Yeah, I guess like, that's true. It's you, not the same. Friend with a boat versus friend with a gun. Like, eh. Yeah, you, you got to have that cash on hand. You never know what type of opportunity. Oh, this is definitely a rural community when you're like, you know, somebody might just be selling a gun. Like, yeah. Seriously. Although I chuckle about that, I did end up with a, a, a great utilitarian browning shotgun that has been uh, The word now. utilitarian and browning should never be used in the same sense. Well, in this case it is, right? It's just a, <laughs> it's a great, like, you know, pump action, simple, you know. It's a finely crafted tool, David. Yes, it's put a that precision in a, instrument. Put that in a gun safe with a dehumidifier, keep it well oiled. It's going to hold its value. Yes, and that's actually what happens. So Good. glad we had this talk. Okay. Um, Back to the mattress conversation. Yes. So why is this such a like? Why do you okay. think it's a bad idea? Because number one, you can lose it a lot easier. You could lose it in a fire. You could lose it in a theft. Like there's a People lot of steal mattresses, people, huh? Well, funny story in Europe. <laughs> There was a guy who literally put his entire life savings in his mattress. Like, he was sleeping on the money. Sleeping on it. Okay. And so the guy dies, and he had been dead in the place for a while. Ew. And they came in, and they pitched the mattress. They pitched him. And then the heirs come in to look at belongings. They find the note hey, my entire life savings is in the mattress. It was over a million dollars of physical cash stuffed in a mattress, and that mattress went to the dump, and the money was never found. And the funny thing about it is, where does the liability lie? <laughs> in the person who can't talk anymore? Well, it's I one mean, of those, that's, that, that's of exactly where the lawyer mindset goes is, well, did somebody have permission to throw the mattress away? Well, yeah, and yeah. who gave them permission? Because was that an authorized, or was did somebody just improperly dispose of property? And mm -hmm. ah! right, so, yeah. Uh, which means all this means to me is a couple things. One, better treasure map or mattress. Mm -hmm. Come on, like not a fire safe, not Here, something simple. Here's another thing to think about: purchasing power. Right, inflation as of late has been really bad. Yeah, so that was my best Trump voice for you. It's yeah. been really bad. It's been horrible. Yeah. Inflation's taking our country. It's destroying it. We need to get it back. No. And, 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 and it was at that point that this clip went viral. <laughs> You're welcome <laughs> like, for that. I need to. I got to figure out a better one. I would. I would try to do like Jordan Peterson or something, and I would just butcher it. So I'm like, You're welcome. You know. Uh, so, <laughs> moving on. Uh, <laughs> so, no. so if inflation's bad and your money's just sitting there doing nothing, you're sliding backwards. Your hundred thousand dollars might now only be able to purchase ninety thousand dollars worth of stuff. Whereas if you would have at least had it in some high yield savings or high yield money market account making five percent, well, if inflation's five percent, you yeah. made five percent. This is Whammy. largely, you so broke even. this is my funny thing. It kind of rings truer in our area, right? I mean, see, somebody watching or listening to this in another area is going to be like, you serious, man? But uh, <laughs> the idea of what do you keep in your safe, this is where gold and guns actually preserve value better than money in the mattress. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and they, in theory, have a more they're more tradable at the end of the world, right? So if you're truly a prepper, those are better assets for preppers. I think I but might be more of a prepper than we I'd care like to admit. admit. Yeah. The you gun know, hoarding thing's a problem. It is. I'm just going to say it. Come yeah. on. 
There's, uh, you know, you, you only have so many places to strategically well, leave munitions in the event of a, like, I have a red a dawn or yeah. something. I don't even know what we would call it. I have an ammunition hoarding problem, too, it, especially if it's on sale. Like, I just got another, what was it, 500 rounds ordered. This is a little like trying to say fireworks are an investment. The ammo is an investment. If you've watched the price of Because you can't trade it. I mean, you can sell it oh later, so. There was guys that were buying, literally. We are this, so far off script you know right what? now, it's just okay. so you guys know. It's, it's no, by, by all means, carry on. I, I think our listeners actually care. I, I think this is, I've never really done this before, but like, a, you know, I've had the crazy idea of could you, like, what would be the legality around creating a munitions and firearms trust that had fractional ownership so that you could essentially invest in the asset class with specificity. Right. Right. Because historically speaking, it's really gone up. Right. If you and if you don't believe me, here's the interesting thing. Watch this election cycle and watch some of these. Like I don't normally make a whole lot of predictions. Mm, um, this is but, true. But here's the thing. If you see um, a, a Harris presidency, look for gun prices to skyrocket. Yep. If you see a Trump presidency, gun prices should remain stable or possibly decline. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? And and if you the the answer is simple, right? If people believe there's a threat that guns will be removed, then they will go into hoarder mode and start buying them up it's as quick as so possible. It's so real. I've watched that happen so many times. It's it's a it's a one of those things that's sort of politically linked and it's so it's difficult to handicap because right now polling data is difficult to be to rely upon. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's why it's kind of interesting as well. What factors would contribute to these things? I'm not saying to go make bets on firearm stocks. I'm just saying there's an interesting piece of data to watch, and this is probably what this is probably what's going to play out. Not investment advice. Yeah. Okay. I'm glad we had that talk. Um, so, bottom line, cash under the mattress. <laughs> we think that uh, there are other ways it, to store value it, in tangible goods yeah <laughs> and uh that might protect you better against inflation than oh. cash which does not protect against inflation yeah i mean okay. can you really blame people though you're taught to put your pennies in a piggy bank and just let it sit there so yeah that's uh, there's so much going on in there but all right here's so, another bizarre one for you though okay listen i'm listening this might not be a misconception this is more kind of just bizarre but People that buy the extended warranty, okay. rarely does that really work out in your favor. I saw like a stat that uh, the average consumer spends about 10 to 15 percent of the product's value on that extended warranty, and they're almost never used. Mm -hmm. So you're just paying more for the product. Mm -hmm. So that's I'm, one way to kind of save some money. Quit I'm not that extended a fan. Warranty. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just not. Uh, and it's interesting because the whole, we could have a whole long conversation about insurance and the concept that underlies it in the first place. Right. Like insurance should be renting protection for risk that you're not otherwise willing to absorb. You realize you accidentally just went into the second idea that I had for bizarre spending habits, and it was literally over-insuring low-value items. <laughs> That's so funny. You just walked right into that one. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but you, you've you probably seen it, right? Like, how many times has someone had full coverage on a $1,000 vehicle? Sure. Well, right? The ones that get me are like when somebody buys a $30 piece of electronics off Amazon and then spends 8 bucks to get the protection warranty. Plan. Yeah. And I'm like, just... Go with well, the risk, and if you have to, spend thirty dollars again. And well, and how many times do you forget you even have an extended warranty? All the times. You're like, <laughs> yeah. No, I'm the worst about that stuff. That's why I don't do it, right? If you're um, gonna buy an extended warranty, be prepared to have to get a sharpie out and write on it. I have an extended warranty for this product. It's yeah. You better have like a file of warranties, and it better be really well organized so that you well, can. Well, and use how them. many times do you go to use the warranty, and it's like, well, under these conditions, and this and that, and this and that, and you're like, gosh darn it, I don't even qualify for the warranty that I bought. Yeah, and that 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 is the hard thing about these insurance scenarios in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. Is that they just there's a lot of caveats and gotchas, and here's a simple explanation for why. The insurance company is not interested in losing money either. No. 
right? Nope. So they're going to make sure that if they're insuring a claim, they're specific about how. You know, and so that's that's just part. But yeah, I think that people oftentimes they just and they use insurance for the wrong reasons. Like uh, insurance is a lottery ticket, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know how many times I've seen people that have uh, life insurance and they're retired, <laughs> and I go, well, what's it for? And they go, well, um, because when I die, my kids are going to get it. And I'm like, so do you need it? It's like, no, they paid for everything. They're just keeping it around. Well, I paid for it so long, I don't want to let it go. Right. And it's like, well, you know, it's going to be gone in five more years, right? The, the term expires. Like, what are you paying for this for? Mm -hmm. It's a lottery ticket now if you die. That's right. what it is. Because your use case for the insurance, it's supposed to be either income replacement or it provides for estate liquidity, right? If you owe estate taxes. Like, what are we doing here? <laughs> I love that you used the word lottery because that also happened to be the next lead-in. Oh, no. <laughs> You, you did right. it two times Stop. in a row, David. Stop. How is this possible? Are you cheating? Uh, are you che not you on be purpose. Honest. You can no. be honest right. about this. I'm going to honestly do this. I'm going to say we need to take our break because we're running a tad long. All right. And then when we come at first Matt had to talk about mattresses, now we're going to make him talk about the lottery, not to be played for investment purposes, as I understand it. <laughs> Stick around, we'll be right back. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And at Dixon. You got True Wealth on News Radio 939 FM and 1240 KQE. That's funny. <laughs> no, that was just a. I think I used lottery for something else earlier today. We were filming a video, and I was like, you know, you need to do this and this and this and this and this, or just win the lottery. But one of them was like, how do you make your kids rich? Well, win the lottery and give it to them. So why would you do that? <laughs> no, no, just, you know, long term. Put the, put the money in, put a little bit in over a long period of time, and it'll work out. That's funny. Why are people so convinced that we need to be able to, like, get rich instantly? So, could you, like, answer me that question? Like, why? And, and well, I know the answer, because that would be better, right? Because then I'd have it now. But you wouldn't have developed any of the skills that are required to like make the money and then hang on to it like every time or almost every time lottery winners get a bunch of money and then they just blow it because they have no skills whatsoever to manage these things and it was never like earned right just like to the same thing with inheritance right you get a bunch of money and you've never learned how to manage it or build it what do you do you squander it and you're like well, now i don't have a bunch of money anymore mm -hmm. so golly goodness <sighs> this is just a mini rant to put on the yeah we don't even, you know, we record this stuff, and I don't even know. Does anybody watch it? We get like four views. I mean, they, people listen because they tell Does us. Does this they listen. part go on? It Why? can, yeah. If we talk about it, they'll leave it in there. If it's if it's something fascinating, it's like sure, why not? Well, everything we say is fascinating. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm not so convinced that that's true. I will say this. Your scripting is working out just fine on the show. Yeah. Yes. Although, I think we have four segments and we're a whole segment behind at this point. Are we? Wait. We're not in the. Are oh, we yeah. The, we, this is our second break. So, I guess we have this segment and one more break. So, you have to talk about lottery tickets and all of segment three. I got that. I believe we're, in you. We're good. Yeah. I mean, if you guys have noticed, Matt is systematically taking over because he is, I think, well, I know he's younger. We're pretty sure he's smarter. He seems more motivated, well, except in the morning and the evening and at lunchtime. Those but other than that, he's super motivated. Yeah. I have windows. <laughs> I've got about 15 Or if there's minutes. like an off opportunity to go fishing. It's like, hey, can we get this stuff done? I'm uh, fishing. Like, I did wake up at 5 in the morning to go fishing the other day. See, I, I don't know what gets you out of bed at 5 in the morning besides fishing. Nothing. Maybe an airline flight to no. go fishing. You're like, hey, no, got to fly to Hawaii so you can go deep sea fishing for two I nights. was so mad that I had to wake up at 3 in the morning or whatever it was to catch a flight. I'm like, no one should be awake at this time. Hmm. It's so weird. I can wake up at 6.30 and just drag, just just can't hardly even move but if i wake up at five in the morning to go fishing i'm like gliding on ice it's like whoop, doo, 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 doo. i'm like i don't get it i envy the brain response, how excited you get around it the brain response is wild 
It's like heroin. <laughs> no, it is. <laughs> well, all right. Welcome back to the True Well Show, where you got to catch the podcast you can, or probably the video. I'm when probably it gets breaking David behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. Well, yes, because Matt is um, ludicrous, wild. All we know about Matt is that he is. He doesn't want to wake up in the morning, but if it's for fishing, he doesn't have any trouble with that. Nope. Nope, it's true. My I'm wife like, doesn't understand it. I don't even understand I it. I don't understand it. You know, there's yeah. I, these coaching environments when they say, well, what gets you out of bed in the morning? And I'm like, necessity. <laughs> right? Like, really? Not, like, no, no, my bed is really, like, I'm warm and comfortable. And I'm like, oh, I've finally reached, you know, this peace status. So usually it's like, well, what, why do you get up? Necessity. There's something about when you get up well before dark, right? And you've got that quiet time. You're driving to the river. And then you get in the boat, it's still dark, it's perfectly quiet, you might hear a bird or two. You motor up, you get to your spot, you start fishing in the dark, and then you get to just gradually watch the light come into the day. There's something about that. Whereas you wake up and it's already light outside and you're just like, Ugh. I don't know. Try it. That's all I can recommend. So this is where we would differ. Where What I would be doing would probably be like up as the sun is, before the sun is up, and I would want to like paddle out in the ocean and go surfing or something like that. That could be fun too. Yeah. I think it might be the intermittent fasting as well. Because if I get up at five and I go fish until eight, well, I haven't eaten anything and your body's up earlier and I don't know, it just gives you more energy, I think. Hmm. That could be it too. Well, Mysteries to be solved on another radio show. Here's another mystery for you. I'm going to need you to you. talk to me about lottery ticket. Purpose. Lottery tickets, Matt. Yeah, they're lottery tickets are an investment, right? Well, if you're a good gambler, maybe they are. But no, <laughs> no never, never not. say that. <laughs> <laughs> it literally that. says it on the ticket, not right. to be played for investment purposes. No, that's that's one that I've never understood. I've never played Powerball, bought a lottery ticket, any of it. I'm like, I mean, I've played before because the novelty of the possibility, even right. though it's effectively zero. But you, you know. at least realize that it's not going to happen. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it's it's a zero. It's literally like a... You'd be... It's, it's like, like voting better. so that you complain. Like, if you're a yeah. conservative in Oregon and you, and you vote and, like, you're going to lose, and then... <laughs> but if you don't vote, you don't get to complain. Right. You're just buying a right to complain. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with what a lottery terrible table. attitude, right? Come no, on, you gotta it's real. Vote. You got to vote. Um, well, think about it this way. Say you invest $20 a week in the, into the lottery, right? Um, I'm looking at a stat here that that could be worth about $56,000 in 30 years if you got a flat line return of 7%. That's insane how much money you're just sort of flushing away. You just flushed away a brand new pickup truck. Yeah. Just because... You wanted to have a hope and a prayer yeah. or something. Of that's course, over right. 30 years, that pickup truck probably be going to be $1.7 million. You're not kidding. <laughs> the way You're things are going, kidding. oh in my the, gosh. In the last six years, pickup truck, pick truck prices have doubled. Yeah. Legitimately. It's they just have. like, are you kidding me? Yeah, so. okay. But we've got a lot more to cover, David. Okay, so, so let's other, keep other normal things that are not good, that are, that are yeah, wrong. Well, like, they're, they're, it's the wrong decision, yeah. but it's normal. Let's talk about maybe some, like, kind of misguided investment type strategies that people have. Okay. Um, so this one's kind of a weird one, kind of throwing I'm you a I'm so curveball. guilty of this, and then I'm like, no. Do you hoard gift cards? Not on purpose. <laughs> Not on purpose. No, but... Um, I actually have one sitting on top of my fireplace mantle. It's one of those prepaid visas. I don't know if there's anything on it. And I never want to go use it because I'm afraid that it's going to bounce at a zero. And, but there's probably money on it, right? And so if you look at the stats, about $3 billion in gift cards so goes So think about this for a second, year. right? $3 billion. Starbucks is a bank. Because what are you doing? Or Dutch Brothers, right? You oh, buy. I bought a gift card. Mm -hmm. I gave them money in advance. They're not paying me interest for it. Right. And they have an immediate margin because you know that the product that they have is going to cost them less than what they sell it to you for. Mm -hmm. So what a brilliant idea, right? It's Let's crazy. just collect the money from you in advance and you could finance us. Mm -hmm. So they're just kind of like little banks. Yep. Or yeah. maybe big banks, honestly. Starbucks is huge, right? Well, if $3 billion goes unredeemed, 
like how much of that is Starbucks? Because I feel like Starbucks is like one of the heaviest hitters with the gift cards. Like, yeah, give this to someone you love. Surely they love Starbucks. This is kind of where like my Amazon gift cards they don't go unredeemed because they just go into the hopper, and when it's time, I just have like the credits until they're gone. I <laughs> am a sucker for Amazon. The same way that you're a sucker for Costco, I'm the same way with Amazon. Oh. Well, yeah, it's I'm bad. guilty. Costco is my favorite store. I've even said it publicly. That doesn't make it my favorite stock. You must like the adventure, store. right? Like, you like the adventure of, like, what am I going to find in this store? I like the adventure of, I don't have to move. It just shows up at my house. I didn't even oh, have to Oh, yeah. No, I, I, you know, I am a girl dad. I'm the only male in the house. Sometimes you just need to go into a bulk store. <laughs> where, where there's coolers and yeah. batteries. Yeah, and it's like, I mean, like, there's tires that are taller than me. And I'm like, oh, yes, this is what I needed, right? <laughs> it's like, so you just funny. need that sometimes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And I can also pick up, you know, like, dinner, so. Yeah. You can save a lot of money if you're smart. Yeah, you can also waste a lot of money if you're not. Right, so, like I bought like, five I'm, pounds of lasagna, but I'm only going to eat one of it and pitch the rest in the garbage. I tell you Save what, some money. We, uh, what? I can't tell you how much uh, like spinach doesn't get consumed. Because, well, it's the same as five pounds of spinach. It's the same as one pound we in the grocery store. We need to, like, store. create, like, a Costco sharing program. <laughs> co where, Yeah. It's like, <laughs> I'm going to buy the spinach, and I'll trade you for those socks that you're going <laughs> to <Yes. laughs> You bought a hundred pack of socks? <laughs> like, what? I really like socks. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. Man, deep right, weeds again. Gift cards. And, yeah. All right. Oh, this one's so easy. It doesn't even take a long time, though. Run, um, run it down. So what do you got? People that don't invest for the free money from their employer in a retirement plan. If, you're, if your company actually offers a match to your retirement plan, you should take it. Right, mathematically, you should take it because consider this for a moment. If I put 2% in and they match me 2%, I now have 4%. I doubled my return, right? Yep. If I cashed out and paid the penalties, I'd still have more money than I started. It's crazy. Right? So you're like, you, you just got to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Get the match. It's free money. Yeah. Okay, so we're not discussing that anymore. Just figure it out. And if you can't figure it out, Oh man, your life's gonna be really hard because, like, really, you passed up on free. Mm -hmm. I mean, free to you, right? The employer's paying for it, but free to you, and you walked away from that. Oh man, I can't help you. Here's another good one for you. Hit me. Chasing past performance. I got an example. I'm gonna ride an example into this one. Okay. I had someone recently who was like, "All right, I'm gonna make a huge investment, and I'm gonna just buy Nvidia stock because it's making money." And I'm like. Have you seen what it already did, right? Like you've yeah, already thirty-five had... percent off peak. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, ugh, like you really want to jump in after it's already had its run. And a lot of people do that. They just look at what performed well last year, and then they go buy that thing. And it's do you like, want, you want another true story? Yeah, please. So this really happened. Um, I had uh, in a former life before this firm. So this is uh, more than fourteen years ago. Okay. But. Uh, in a former life, I had somebody come in that wanted to invest, and they were retired, and they were looking for a retirement income stream, and they brought to me a real estate investment trust mutual fund that they wanted me to purchase for them because it had annualized returns of over 17%, and they calculated their retirement income stream based on those returns. No! I, I, I will tell you, I did refuse them as a client and said, I don't believe that this is a realistic expectation. Mm -hmm. It was, I was a lot younger, it was hard to do, right? Yeah. But I remember just saying, I, I, it's not that I can't do it for you, I won't do it for you, I think it's malpractice. The year was 2007. Ooh, ooh, ho, ho, ho. That tells us the ending, so yeah. you can skip that part. Yeah, and so I don't know how that played out because they sort of disgruntledly left and said, I'm fine, I'll find somebody else to do it for me. Yeah. And I said, very well, but it won't be here. You know, investors who tend to chase that past performance, 
statistically really don't actually do that great. They tend to no. trail like one to two percent lower average returns than the people who yeah, just consistently invest. Yeah, there's been a lot of long-term studies about that too. Return chasing doesn't work. No. It's interesting because there's some short-term studies that suggest that trends tend to persist for a little while, but, but looking in the rearview mirror, uh, so if you can find the current performer, it tends to do okay. But I'm not suggesting you should chase that because the, the, the current winner is next season's loser. I got one more good one for you, David. Do you? Yeah. Is it? A, do we? Should we wait until the next I segment? I think we should because okay. we're gonna we're gonna hit pretty heavy when we come back from this break. All right. Then we'll do this. We, we'll grab the break. All right. When we come back, Matt's got one more good one. Yeah. Right? Heavy hitter. Heavy hitter. Stick around. We'll be right back. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. Yeah, True Wealth on News Radio 90s or 9 FM and 1240 KQEN. Yeah, is this the point where we make that pathetic plea? Like, if you would just subscribe and send it to friends, we can propagate this message, which is what if you could do financial, still have some fun doing it? And here's the crazy thing what if it fit under the umbrella of stewardship? which is actually like the big deal for us in all of this. It's like, how can you do this? We have these shirts that say ethical capitalist on them, right? And when people ask like, Matt, what's an ethical capitalist? Is that actually a question? Yeah. How would you define ethical capitalist? I think it's wanting a free market, but not such a free market that it goes out of control and people do such greedy things that they slit each other's throats. Yeah. I, I would say uh, ethical capitalists are when both parties benefit from the deal. Yeah. Right? Like a, like, a, like a fair exchange of mutual benefit is ethical capitalism. Right? It's not gouging the other person where they feel like they're, you know, the, yeah. you know, the transaction is a kind of hold their, no, their nose or because they, they don't have a better alternative. You know, it's right. like, no, no. You, it's a, like both people feel like they're in a better spot because of it. That's, that's where you want to be. Yeah. All right. Hey, gang. Welcome back to the home stretch of the True Wealth Show. I'm in the studio with Matt Dixon, and we are covering what you had a big example you guys got to grab the podcast to figure out like the rest of the context here big example of misguided savings and investment strategy yeah here's one that well, this is was this, this performance a chasing or is this a whole new thing well this is kind of like diving in almost to like you're planning you're you're like doing financial planning for yourself right okay yeah so you're like planning out your future and this is a sad one but i bet you've seen it someone overestimates their future inheritance. They're like, you know what? I don't got to take care of things today because, yeah, parents are real well off and I'm going to be just fine. And then guess what? They spent it all. Or there wasn't as much there as you think. And then you wind up banking on it and it's not there. Or maybe you just weren't that great of a person and they just said, we're going to donate it to this charity over here because we like that idea better than giving it to you. Ouch. I, I will say that fortunately that's not been a common theme with folks in our practice. That does make sense though. Right. If you consider yeah. for a moment the people that come to financial professionals, there, there's, there's broad sweeping generalizations here, but folks that come early if usually they're developing their own plan and so they're not counting on an inheritance per se. Or if they are, there's a lot more information and they're being strategic about how they plan for it. Right? right. Now, there is a group of people that shows up to financial planners at the 11th hour and hopes for a Hail Mary savior. Right? Like, yeah. hey, I'm retiring in two weeks. This is what I got. Can you make sure I can do this? And then you ask that question, do you got an inheritance? Because... Yeah, and you're <laughs> like, I mean, sometimes the answer is simply, well, no. Oh, I, or, or people that will show up and say, well, aren't you like a stockbroker? Can you make me a whole bunch of money with this? And it's like they've got, you know, a modest sum and they really expect very outrageous returns, like, you know, 50% annualized returns or something. And I'm like, yeah, no, no, yeah. I can't. Yeah. We, I saw this guy on the Internet. It's like, well, maybe you need to talk to them, but we can't do it. Right. Right. Which is funny because if you're watching this on the Internet, you're like, yeah, no, some other guy on the Internet can promise you impossible returns. That's like, not our jam. Yeah. They're probably trying to sell you something. Yeah. I mean, well, how many times have you seen that? Like, hey, follow me. You know, I had I made 30% last year, and I'm going to show you how to do it. And you're like, ooh, red flag. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, boy, there's so much. That, that's the story for We should chalk that up as, as a future show. Let's do right? it. Right, which is the whole, like, when the 
why things don't always scale, like why mm -hmm. Warren Buffett can't make 100% returns every year anymore, right? But they used to, and yeah. there's, there's actually some rational well, reasons for why. And Warren Buffett plays a lot more defense than he does offense. It's and not just that, it's a scale game. When you're investing billions, right. you can't, a, like a, a tiny, like you pick a $100 million company can triple in value, it doesn't move the needle. Yeah. So they don't spend any time on, on those really small investments anymore. That leaves opportunities for other investors to do really good investigative work to discover those things. Mm -hmm. But they're just not going to be on the radar of institutional managers. Yeah. So anyway, we digress. So um, one of those overestimated future inheritances problem. Yeah. Here's a funny one. Um, I'm going to let you describe it, but it, it actually does kind of, it, it irritates me that we have this uh, all or nothing culture about this one. Are you talking about credit cards? I am. Yeah. Right? I mean, here's the thing. I've never once not paid my credit card bill in full, right? And Mine is set up to auto pay. Like it literally pulls from the sure, bank and yeah. just pays it. I get so much cash back. If the main place I'm shopping is Amazon and mm -hmm. I have an Amazon credit card, I get 5% back and then I get like one or 2% back on gas. So it's yeah. like, why not use it? I've paid for almost all of my family's airline tickets. With just a credit card. With, with the credit card points for the last three or four years when we take vacations. See, there's a, there's a reason to have it. But it yeah. goes back to, once again, you know, if you're going to shoot yourself in the foot because you're not going to mm -hmm. be able to manage it, don't have it. But it yeah. well, doesn't mean that they're horrible. There, there's other stuff people don't think about that come with credit cards, too. Like, here's one of my favorites. I have mm -hmm. a business card. And if I pay the cell phone bill with that card, it includes handset insurance. Here's a weird one for you. You ready for a weird one? Yes. When I went to buy a vehicle one time, I have a really high credit card limit, mm -hmm. and I had a bunch of cash ready to do the down payment. But I looked at that and I said, wait a minute, why don't I do the down payment on the credit card and get all those points? And, and then, then just, pay, just off the card. pay off the card. And I did it, and I racked up so many points that month. And I'm like, right. sweet. You see, and really, that's kind of a failure on the dealership's part because they should be willing to just work with you to not pay the transaction fee. Right. But if they're not willing to work with you, nope, they weren't. They may as well do it. Yep, so stick it to them. Um, here's one more for you before we run out of time. So this is one I'm going to admit to it I'm guilty of. Many are. There's so will, many examples of this. I obsess over small savings. Like, oh, I can save $3 on that item instead of that item, and I'll spend 20, 30 minutes looking, like, oh, which one is it? And then it's like, you probably... I do this on Amazon sometimes. You yeah. go down the rabbit hole of comparison. Yeah. Here's where it really gets people. Gas, right? I drive across town to save three cents on gasoline, and I have a 20-gallon tank, and you go, that was 60 cents savings, uh -huh. and you use that much in gas to get there. You want to know something? I'm going to throw my <laughs> wife under the bus for a moment because she's probably not listening, and it's okay. It's so funny. Did you know? <laughs> yeah. She can't tell you what the price of gas is. She doesn't even look. She just pulls in and fills up. I'm like, you kill me. Like, you got to look. you got to, like, know yeah. what place well, There's it. a threshold. It's about uh, a dollar a gallon or something on a 30-gallon tank. You're like, well, that's lunch that's, now. Seriously. You know? yeah. It adds up. If you, I mean, the, it's funny because you talk about being fee conscious and then not paying attention to the gas thing. Mm -hmm. But, th but it's, th it's the time Her issue. theory is the cost of gas is what it is, whether it's $3 a gallon, $4 a gallon, or $2 a gallon. I'm going to buy it anyway. Pull in, get what you need, and get on with your day. Yeah, well, uh, if it's faster, right? Yeah. My theory is if it can give me an excuse to be at Costco. Oh, there you go. <laughs> now like, you're I need to get gas. Back. Well, since I'm here. Uh -huh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> anyway, it's funny because uh, here's another way to phrase this, right? Sometimes we, we walk over a dollar to pick up a dime, mm -hmm. right? And we miss... We miscalculate because we fail to calculate our time in the equation. Well, and that's a lot of what it is, is that the gas prices are oftentimes nominal compared to the value of that, your time. That whole theory of, you know, step over a dollar to pick up a dime, how many times do we see that with, like, just even getting an advisor? You're like, I don't want to pay the advisory fee, and then you end up doing some sort of huge mistake with your estate that costs you a hundred grand or something, and it's yeah, like, yeah. you would have been better off to have paid the $80 a month to have the advisor or whatever. Right. So, I, I, I think that having... 
um, I, I really I believe that having good mentors and good advisors is really, really key because mistake avoidance is often far cheaper than the cost to have these other people in your lives. Well, if you want to see some potential ways to avoid mistakes, give us a call, 541-375-0898, or go to the website at littlejohnfs.com. That's it. Uh, initial consults are always free. We just want to get to know you better. So if you don't have somebody, give us a call. If you do have somebody, give them a call. Until next time, I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. You've been listening to True Wealth on News Radio 93.9 FM and 1240 KQEN.